So now it is time to start the plenary session number two, which is talking about partnership to support school to work transition. And this session is going to be shared by the Deputy Director General from the Swedish Public, Public Employment Service, Mr. Klaus Olsson. Most welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I suppose that uh, most of you know that youth unemployment is high in many OECD countries, and in particular if we compare with the unemployment rate for adults. This is especially true for Sweden, unfortunately. Uh, adult unemployment is comparatively low, while youth unemployment is quite high. In fact, if we compare Sweden with, for instance, Germany, which is a country with, with low youth unemployment, the unemployment rate for adults is about the same in both countries, while the youth unemployment rate is considerably higher in Sweden. Uh, if the youth unemployment rate is compared with the adult unemployment rate, it is four times as high in Sweden, while it is twice as high in, in Denmark, which is another country with a fairly low youth unemployment rate, and only 1.3 times as high in Germany. These are, I'm not sure that these are the, the most recent figures, but that's about the way it looks. And indeed, in Sweden, we have the biggest gap between youth unemployment and adult unemployment in the whole EU area. Uh, this is a special concern for, for us, of course, uh, but it also, it's also clear from the figures I mentioned that it is a more or less universal phenomenon that youth unemployment rate is higher than the adult unemployment rate. Uh, this does to some extent uh, reflect uh, natural causes, I would say. Nearly, or at least most, young people start their career by being unemployed. Every year a high number of people leave the school system, uh, most of them without having signed for a job already. And this in itself implies that we should expect as a general rule youth unemployment to be somewhat higher than the unemployment rate for adults. Another explanation for the high youth unemployment rate is that the figures include full-time students who are actively seeking jobs but who are studying as their main activity. Uh, and this indicates that they're primarily looking for, for a job to supplement their student grants. And I would say this is, a, this is unemployment, but it is a different kind of unemployment. In fact, in Sweden, the unemployment rate is around 35% in the age group 16 to 19 years old, of which a full 22 percentage points represent those who are both studying and registered as unemployed. So that's, it's clearly an explanation. Uh, that is important, at least for the younger groups. In Germany, on the other hand, uh, there are a few young people who are both studying and registered as unemployed, which indicates here that the differences between the education systems are important as a part of the explanation for youth unemployment rates. Uh, young people, I should say, are in some sense an attractive group in the labour market. In general, they do not stay unemployed for a very long time. Uh, the duration of unemployment for young people has always been shorter for, than for adults, and I think this is true for, for nearly every country. However, young people also lose their jobs quite easily, and more often than adults. And that is, of course, because they're to a much greater extent employed on temporary jobs. So if you simplify, simplify things a bit, I think you could say that for many young people, unemployment is not so much a problem of finding a job, but rather of, of keeping it or having continuity at it. Uh, it takes some time for young people to become permanently established in the labor market. And this is certainly the case in Sweden, but I think it is also true for most OECD countries, possibly with a few expectations. So, obviously, the transition from school to a job, and in particular to a permanent job, is not an easy journey for many young people. Helping them to successfully make this transition requires a joined-up approach involving schools, vocational and education training institutions, employment services, and, of course, employers. Uh, the work does not stop at securing employment, Skills utilization and career progression also need to be considered. 
Uh, and this session is an opportunity to hear how both local public officials as well as employers, employers are addressing these issues and what employers need from the public sector. Uh, and the setup is as follows. There will first be an introductory remark by Katrin Höckel, and then a keynote address by Maria Stockhaus, and a comment on that by Martin Collins. And that is the first part of the session, and I will try to be strict with the time limits. I have allocated some 10 minutes for each speaker. Uh, then we will switch and we will have a panel discussion involving three employers. Uh, I will ask some questions to start with and then we will open up for discussion with the floor for questions from you. And then if we have time I will make a short wrap up. So I will start by introducing Katrin Höckel, the first speaker. Katrin is a policy analyst at the OECD's Directorate for Education and Skills. She coordinated the OECD skills strategy and worked on the VET policy review. A German national, Katrin holds a Master of Science in History and Political Science and a Master's degree in Public Administration. Welcome Katrin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I've been asked to frame this session and what I haven't been told that my task will also be to um, wake you up after lunch session. That's always the most difficult session uh, to speak to. And um, what I was even less aware of was that I will keep you from enjoying uh, the nice sun, especially for the Swedes. They seem to be really thrilled about the weather. So I, um, I apologize for that. So, um, the session is on, on the partnerships and uh, kind of the, the ways of, of facilitating the difficult transition from uh, education to, to employment. And this is the situation, um, kind of in short, that's the situation uh, we are facing, the number you see here, and I promise that will be the only figure uh, I, will, I will show you this afternoon, uh, is the, the need rate, the not in uh, employment, education or training rate for the 15 to 24 year olds in the OECD, that's the OECD average. So that's kind of, in brief, um, the, the situation that we are that we're dealing with and we just heard that you know the figures are very different between countries and um, and some are having bigger troubles with this than, than others but uh, in general that's that's kind of our, our task here now obviously this is a snapshot you know 15 percent um, is a snapshot in time and it doesn't show you anything about uh, individual situations there's some youth who you know, just stay in this situation for a very short time and they are resilient, they are motivated, so they thrill and, and, and drive and uh, make a big jump uh, soon thereafter. But then there's a majority of people, uh, and that's the ones we're concerned with, who get stuck in the situation and it's really, um, it's just a bad start. It's just, uh, for me, I mean, just imagining the situation, you're finally out of education, out of school, and uh, the first thing you're dealing with is unemployment. Um, so I think it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty um, important um, issue to, to think about. Now, at the OECD, um, especially since the crisis and rising numbers of youth unemployment, um, we've thought quite a lot about the issue. And uh, we've put together with various directorates uh, involved. Myself, I'm from the Education Directorate, but there have been colleagues uh, involved in that too. We have put together uh, what we called a Youth uh, Action Plan. And it kind of contains all the central um, conclusions that we draw, drew from our work from the last uh, several years on youth. And I'm not going to go into the details here. They go from improving the, the school system, reducing dropout, the topic we had yesterday, to career guidance, to Im, you know, improving the VET system, helping the transition throughout, uh, Im, improving the um, demand, labor demand situation, etc. So that's kind of pretty well-established uh, research facts, which in order to kind of initiate or frame this uh, discussion, just wanted to distill to some like very central, or what I uh, believe as, as very uh, central themes. 
Now, this, uh, this uh, session here is on uh, kind of the partnerships, and, uh, and I think it cannot be repeated often enough that it's really everyone's business. And it's funny how, in particular, this, this kind of area, transition, education to work, youth unemployment, um, there's a lot of blaming going on. And it's, it's always people seem to be knowing best who is to be blamed uh, for, for the difficult situation. And I think it's very important to kind of reverse that. And every institution, but not only institution, and I will say something about that in a minute, um, should think about um, what their particular role is. I think every single person sitting here in the room or outside um, could contributing, contribute something to uh, ameliorating uh, the situation. Um, so that's the first point. It's like everyone, it's really everyone's business. The second point, and somehow I, I was very much in animal mood when I put together this, uh, this presentation, <laughs> trying to think what kind of images uh, can, can maybe stay in your mind to, to, uh, to illustrate uh, the points I want to make. Here the point is that um, if you think about successful, situa su successful systems, in particular education systems, that facilitate this transition, very often we come back to its well-functioning vocational education and training system. And why is this really the case? I mean, there's a lot of factors why well-functioning uh, education, vocational education and training system um, facilitate the transition. And I think the core point, and that holds not only for vocational education and training, but also for entrepreneurship uh, or, or more academically oriented um, uh, education is to create that protected space, because that's exactly what happens. A young person who is in an apprenticeship situation is protected, is still in education, so is still kind of taken care of and can grow, even rather fat, as you see those ones, um, and uh, at the same time can try out to be a professional, to be you know, in a work situation and to make all sorts of mistakes and not be like fully punished by being out there already uh, in, the, in the labor market. Now it's getting even wilder with my animal pictures. Um, here you can think, you know, what's the talent of this little one? Um, and you know, if you're into classical dressage, as, as I am, uh, you would immediately see it's a levade. You know, that's kind of the most sophisticated uh, movement in dressage. Maybe this one, at some point, will be able to do it. But you know, seriously, um, one like the third point I wanted to make is that I, I believe we should also like broaden our definition of talents. And that's you know, I'm obviously having the OECD perspective and. The work we've been doing uh, over the last uh, years has been very much focused on like PISA as our flagship. And of course, it's hugely important um, to develop these foundation skills in young people. Reading, writing, uh, numeracy, etc., is core. Nobody would doubt that. But it's problematic if we get stuck there and we focus too much on, on these particular issues. And just, you know, imagine for yourself, what is the kind of thing that you're really not good at, I don't know, repairing your bike or telling stories or something like that. And then just imagine you have to do that for 12 years every day. And that's pretty much what kids are facing who are just not good at these academic core skills and generally at uh, academic studies. And that's still the main talk. You know, you have to succeed in academia somehow and that's only what really success means. And everything else is like, you know, more or less latently or, or quite obviously um, second, second level or, or even dismissed. And I think that's, I think that's problematic. And uh, I think just in all we're doing, broadening the definition of what talent means um, is maybe a way of, um, you know, improving the, the situation. Which leads me... Um, to the last point, where I really want to uh, come up with something that's a little less maybe known or in the debate or, or um, more innovative in a way. Um, and that's about rethinking our notion of employment and broadening it to something which I would rather call um, a useful occupation. Uh, and um, so, and also that includes even the kind of way we are looking uh, onto these issues, statistically speaking. We have these categories, employed, unemployed, 
inactive, those are pretty rigid uh, categories, and a lot falls through the, uh, the grid in a way, uh, if we just stick narrowly to that. And I've been quite inspired by a recent uh, reading. Uh, maybe you, some of you know her, her work. Uh, her name is uh, Julia Chor, and she's professor of, of uh, sociology at Boston College and previously was in Harvard, um, the um, uh, economics uh, department in Harvard. And she's quite a pioneer in, in this new economic thinking and a thinking that goes away from a very narrow focus on GDP growth as kind of the only way of defining progress uh, onto looking to something that's more quality of life as something that should really guide our thinking uh, about progress. And one of her core topics, and that's really what, what I found uh, rather interesting, was to look at um, time essentially, and time in relation to working. And her idea is um, that we, there should be more of work sh sharing. Work is kind of a scarce resource in a way. And uh, it's increasingly scarce, especially if you want to save the, you know, kind of la what's, what's left of natural resources. If you do uh, you just power the economy more and more, um, it's going to disappear entirely. And um, so she's suggesting to, instead of just you know, working too much, especially the people who are in very high quality jobs, there's a lot of burnout and these symptoms of working too much, sharing that with people who are uh, currently uh, unemployed, be it young people or, or uh, older people. And um, kind of thinking about that, I, I related to two concrete examples that have to do with work sharing, time sharing and education and the school to work transition. Um, and unemployment. One is the German Kurzarbeit. Um, that was this initiative that was quite successful during the crisis, um, where essentially employers, employees and the government worked together to shorten working time but keeping people in jobs, which is kind of one thing that, that really worked. And um, the other example would be in Switzerland, um, something I recently learned was that in, um, in the VET system, the Vocational Education and Training System in Switzerland, which I'm a, a huge fan of, um, one element that's really not so known but really important is that a lot of professionals volunteer. And they spend their time, not just strictly working, but they volunteer their time to um, help the young people, the apprentices, to uh, get a good start. And these are just a couple of ideas, um, maybe for you to, to think about, and uh, maybe to uh, debate uh, later on, which I think worthwhile in that context. Thank you. Thank you, Katrin. Thank you very much. I was going to ask you a question, in fact. If that's still in it, the time frame. You, you kept the time limit so strict that I have <laughs> time for one minute question. I have my timekeeper right in front of me. You, uh, you mentioned that uh, well-functioning vocational and education systems is a core thing. And, and um, you mentioned Switzerland. Do you have any other good examples to pro provide us with? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the German-speaking systems, they are not strictly the same, but similar in that what they really succeed in doing is, um, you know, combining theory, school-based uh, you know, school learning with work-based learning. So those ones are probably you know, what everyone looks up to. But then another one which I was quite impressed with was uh, Australia, because they also, uh, they're quite good at like, involving the employers in, in their work and setting up a national system of qualifications. And that's another, you know, if you, to avoid always mentioning the German-speaking ones, that would be another example. Thank you very much. So those of you who want to learn something, go to a German-speaking <laughs> country, or possibly Australia. Our next speaker is Maria Stockhaus, and uh, her speech will be followed by a comment by Martin Collins. Maria is the deputy mayor of Solentuna municipality and also chair of the education committee at the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions. Yes. Please, Maria. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, I'm sad about the black curtains there, but uh, you can enjoy the view of Stockholm uh, during your breaks, I assume. Uh, the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions, and I'm going to call it SALA in my speech because that name is too long to say more than once, uh, is both an employer's organization and an uh, organization that uh, represents and advocates for uh, local governments in Sweden. Uh, all municipalities, county councils and regions in Sweden are members, uh, but the membership is voluntary, but everybody chooses to be a member. 
Uh, as an employer organization, uh, we ha there's about one million uh, uh, employees, which makes us the largest employer organization in Sweden. And we also have an ambition to sort of stay ahead, uh, one step ahead, ahead when it comes to public policies that affect our members and be able to uh, influence uh, wh where they end up. I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about background uh, in economics and also about a project that Solar is running called Plug In, that uh, is about uh, preventing dropouts from uh, secondary school. Uh, I think uh, all, most of our countries see uh, that the economies are starting to pick up and that employers are starting to uh, employ people again. Uh, but there's uh, a mismatch. We have a lot of people unemployed and they don't have the skills to match what the employers need. And that shows the, uh, that we, there's a really big importance to invest in, in skills and human capital to re reduce this skills match mismatch, because otherwise uh, it's going to be difficult for our economies to grow and we're going to have a lot of people uh, that we need to support through different social welfare systems. In Sweden, the importance of a secondary degree has evolved since the early 90s, uh, but the share of students who fulfill a secondary education has stayed the same. And this has become a really serious problem during the last 10 years. We have an increasing group of young people who uh, without secondary education who face all the harder demands from the employers and, in an, and they risk uh, long-term unemployment and dependence on the social welfare system. And in Sweden, the social welfare system, the biggest part of that is actually paid at the municipality level, which means that it's, uh, that's one reason why Solar is investing in this plug-in uh, project, because it's, uh, we don't want to end up paying for all these people who are unemployed and they are also very unhappy and we don't want uh, our citizens to be unhappy. Uh, the plug-in uh, project is, is uh, as I said, uh, it uh, aims to reduce the number of students who drop out of the secondary, uh, secondary school. And it's important for us, as I said, they are, they are unable to meet the uh, employer's demands for skills if they don't have a secondary education. And it's also, uh, if you look at the research, people who don't uh, have an employment or uh, have a lower level of education, they also have uh, poorer health and develop destructive lifestyles and also have a higher mortality rate. So there's a lot of reasons to uh, address this issue. And it's, in summary, I think it's, you can establish that the, the school system's lack of ability to inspire learning uh, is uh, a failure to, or a failure to adapt education to the outside world is uh, meet the individual needs of the students. It's important if we want them to uh, stay in school. Since uh, the plug-in project started in 2012, uh, there has been a full focus on trying out different methods, methods providing more young people with the conditions to complete their education. It's a project that works on three levels, the national, regional, and local level. At the national level, it's owned and managed by Solar, uh, and the main role is to sort of develop an overall framework on, uh, for the project and to collect and analyze results at the national level. At the regional level, the project is managed by five autonomous regional associations. They have a uh, mainly a co coordinating role, coordinating the development of the local initiatives and to report to the local level, or to, to the national level. The core part of Plugin is actually more than 70 initiatives uh, or projects developed and implemented on a local level, uh, municipal level, or even at the school level. And I want to give you one uh, example of uh, one of these 70 initiatives. It's from a municipality called Oskarshamn, south of Stockholm on the coast. They had a group of students in secondary education with very low grades, and they were given the task of collecting and renovating old bicycles. They traveled with the renovated bicycles to Estonia, where the bikes were delivered to families in poor circumstances. The project included the subject Swedish, English, but also the understanding of living conditions in other countries. The students did several presentations about the projects for politicians, for other um, authorities in, in their local community. And this, uh, if you look at 
uh, the students in, in, uh, in this group, they, at this municipality, they, decre they, they decreased the number of uh, dropouts from 9.7 to 1.3 percent. And this is just one example of new ways to think about education that can help motivate uh, students. And I think you, you talked about stu students having to uh, do scholarly work when they, or academic work when they would, they're not, not good at it. These kids were good at renovating bicycles and got the chance to do that. Over the three years of this project, more than 6,000 young people will take part in around 400,000 hours of plug-in work. This makes uh, plug-in the largest, most complex project dealing with the issues of early school leavers in Sweden. It's also a major initiative if you look on a European context. The objective for plug-in is to half the number of students who fail to complete their upper secondary studies within four years in the participating regions. The, elevation, the evaluation process uh, shows that the project so far has contributed uh, a number of positive interim results that benefit the project's overall objective. Uh, Plug-in's local workshops have provided many young people with better conditions for completing their studies. Tools have been developed to prevent students from leaving school early. The municipalities have also been given more opportunities to make use uh, of these tools in their work. Collaboration on the issue of early school lead, leader, leavers have increased, both vert vertically and horizontally. And the problem of problems of students leaving school early and the necessity to work proactively have emerged on the political agenda and are starting to appear in various forms of steering docu documents. One very important uh, element of plugin is the pluginnovation.sc. It's a website uh, where me all the methods that be are being developed and tried out in the, in the municipalities involved are brought together. Uh, the website also makes research in this field avail available along with ongoing development work on statistics which aims to produce a prototype for student follow-up. Uh, and the findings so far have identified some important beneficial factors when working with at-risk students. It's strengthening the ties to the school, uh, a holistic focus on the individual, and flexibility in terms of organizing and content of teaching, which I think the bicycle uh, project is, is one good example of. The success uh, of each of the secondary, uh, of each upper secondary school is determined by how well it succeeds in inspiring students to learn and how it's, it is to the individual uh, open to its individual st student circumstances and also to ch changes in the outside world. These are challenges that uh, require a constant inquisitiveness uh, and also that we we try to improve our methods the whole time. Our conclusion is that students are helped by an attitude amongst the adults that expresses a view that all young people need at least upper secondary education. To create a school system for all, we require cooperation across borders, openness and constant reassessment of what we do. And also the recognition of success and visualization and dissemination of work methods that work well. In this context, we at Solar hope that we can contribute to a constructive sharing experience included in, through the EU project plugin, which will be continued until June 2015. Every single student study, uh, uh, stud student's study results are important matters for the whole school system and for the labor market, as well as for the individual, uh, in him or herself. Politicians have an important role to play in defining the quality of what schools must achieve, but also of other organizations that contribute to providing young people with good conditions for learning and getting a foothold in the labor market. We need to transform our words here into action and in various way, com ways contribute to giving young people better conditions and opportunities to succeed at school and believe that jobs uh, are waiting just ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. It, certainly, school dropouts is a very important issue in this context. And it, I'm looking forward to learning more about this project, which I hadn't, in fact, heard of before. Now, the next speaker is Martin Collins.
who leads the Glasgow's Employment and Skills Partnership based within the City Council. And as part of his role, man Martin manages the city's approach to school and business partnerships and vocational education. And Martin has a background in community, regeneration, economic development, and young person-centered policy development. Please, Martin, the floor is yours. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I, because I, I, I'm down in the agenda as providing comment rather than having a kind of specific subject, I'm taking that to mean that I didn't really need to prepare anything. So <laughs> we'll see how we go for the next 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> so um, when I, I, I heard about the, the, the plug-in project just yesterday, and um, it, it really chimed with me because a lot of the... Um, the work that's being done and, and, and the, the principles set out are very, very similar to the work we've been doing in, in Scotland and in Glasgow now for the last five or so years. Um, it's all about um, making sure that our most vulnerable young people are supported by a range of stakeholders from both within the school and out with, making sure that um, we, we provide a really kind of support of transition from school into whatever it is that individual young person needs in order to make um, a positive progression from school and to avoid um, unemployment. So there are probably quite a lot of things that we've picked up over the last few years that might be quite useful to share round, round about some of that. Um, because we have, after having made a number of mistakes, more or less halved in, in, in that period of time than the percentage of young people leaving our schools going into unemployment. And it's really been because we've focused very much on nurture, um, on relationships, and it's been much less to do with kind of provision and academic learning and much more about the support of a consistent adult in our young people's lives. And that's what we've found has been the real key to kind of unlocking the potential or at least starting our young people off on the right road. But what I, what I really wanted to talk about here, though, is that we are making lots of progress in respect of our school leavers. We are making a difference. Things are looking much, much better. Glasgow is a comparatively poor city um, in terms of kind of by Western European standards anyway. Um, about half of our population lives in poverty. Um, our life expectancy rate is particularly, le particularly low, the lowest in Western Europe. Um, and any time there's any kind of league table about health or employment, Glasgow is always at the top, um, not in a good way. Um, and so the, we, we have a lot of challenges to face. And I, I, I was beginning to feel a little bit smug about the, um, the successes we had had, ostensibly about reducing unemployment, particularly in the light of the recession we've had and, and how difficult things are in the city in general. But on doing some more work and kind of unpicking where we had got to, um, yeah, within the first year of, of, of leaving school, we're, we're way under 10% in terms of unemployment, and we still have the vast majority of our young people still engaging with us in some way or another. But then you look two or three years further down the line, and we see that in actual fact, what we have been able to manufacture is a kind of temporary blip, but we've not changed people's lives. We've not actually changed the trajectory of where they're going to be. And the life circumstances of somebody um, two years down the line become far more important than the learning they've had in school. Which has made me really question, I suppose fundamentally, have, is the work we've been doing been more about making sure that we achieve the targets we've set ourselves rather than being about making a kind of cultural and, and step change within um, the life circumstances and chances of our young people. And I think very often that's what we do. We work towards achieving targets rather than working towards changing lives. Which makes me think about the purpose of school. What, what's it there for in the first place? And, and I think it's something about equipping our young people to 
um, fulfil their potential, to kind of maximise their strengths and for us to support them um, in any challenges they face that are preventing them from doing so. And when you start thinking about that, it's a, really about happiness and preparing our young people to live a fulfilled life. And a key element of that must be about being economically active and not having to worry about being able to pay the rent or buy clothes for your children or food or whatever. Um, and therefore, once we start talking about um, employment and supporting transition, for us to start thinking about that at age 14, 15 is far, far too late because we've already put patterns in place. We know, I've got a, I've got a um, four-year-old son um, who already is fully aware of kind of gender divisions. And, you know, he'll not watch ballet um, kind of cartoons with ballet in anymore because it's a girl's thing. You think, you know, all of this conditioning is happening so early and these are the kinds of things that we need to be actively challenging. So I kind of set a challenge for our team to be a bit more ambitious about the scope and scale of the work that we do. Um, and what I wanted to start off with was, from age five or age four, what are the messages that need to be going into our children's head that we're keeping challenging every day so that they're not falling into the same kind of stereotypes that, we're all kind of, um, that, that we all tend to do? For example, in, in Glasgow, Year on year, over a quarter of our boys want to leave school and go into the construction industry every year for the last 10 years and probably more. Um, and the same thing happens with over a quarter of our girls want to go into hairdressing. Now, there aren't enough hairdressing jobs or construction jobs in the city for a start. And also, it's setting our sights awful low and we need to be challenging that. So that's the first thing. The first thing that we're doing now in the last year is beginning to look much more at the aspirations and ambitions our children have, because that's so important. Next thing um, we looked at was round about sector-specific skills and employability skills for young people going into secondary education, and not necessarily about pulling our young people into um, a, a separate stream because they're not quite clever enough to work academically, but much more about making sure that our young people um, have the, the kind of rounded skills that they need in order to be a success and have the confidence to feel like they are they're worth something and kind of have bring real value to the school. So there's a big thing about ethos in there. And lastly, there's a bit about transitions. How can we make sure that with our businesses particularly, we know that from the age of 13, 14, our businesses are guaranteeing that they're going to support a proportion of our young people into employment. If we make sure that our businesses are coming into our schools and working with us on the design of curriculum and working with us on the design of new qualifications, then it becomes a kind of, it becomes economically sensible for our businesses to then recruit from that pool of students because they've already been training them for two years. And we've been able to make the financial argument to businesses so we're not really appealing to their, their better nature, their kind of their sense of moral responsibility because that goes as soon as times are tight. But what doesn't go is getting value for money. And that's where we're working towards between our schools and our businesses. And that's, that's the key bit, I think, about partnerships, because it's, it's really about making sure that the strengths of our businesses play in to the strengths that our young people have, and really understanding how both of those link in, and making sure that we in the middle understand all of that and are working with both sides to kind of balance supply and demand. And the last thing I'd want to say is that it, it, alongside all of that, which is great for our mainstream population, our uh, 5,000 or so young people that leave school every year, there's a significant proportion in there that need additional support. And where we've gone wrong in the past very often is create a whole separate set of services for them. 
And what we've done this year is actually do away with a whole load of separate services for our young people who have a physical disability or who have learning difficulties or whatever. And we've, we're just providing the one service, but what we're changing is the level of support that's provided to young people to allow them to access and flourish within that service. So we're beginning to mainstream that. And rather than kind of marginalising big groups of young people, the, the, the ethos is really about let's bring them into the fold and make sure that we're creating a much more inclusive way of looking at how we support our young people into employment. Um, so that kind of very quickly is my kind of unprepared comment response to, um, to, to, to the previous speaker. Um, and hope you found that useful. Thank you very much, Martin, for a very interesting presentation. There was in particular one thing you said that caught at least my attention. I think you said that we're working too much towards targets and not so much towards changing lives. It's something worth thinking of. It's a bit of an echo of criticism of new public management. It's a broader discussion. I don't think we're going to have it this afternoon, but... It's something worth thinking of, I think. Now, next we're going to have a panel discussion with representatives from the private sector, firms, companies that I think have been chosen because they are um, good examples in this area, or I know they have. Uh, I invite Björn Arl Vist, Laurie Fort Harnick, and Jan Erik Sundgren to enter the stage and please have a seat. Björn is the deputy CEO of Nordic Choice Hotels and responsible for the strategic development of the company and all the main services to all of the 170 Nordic Choice Hotels. Lori is Microsoft's general manager for citizenship and public affairs. And in this role, Lori leads Microsoft's global work on corporate social responsibility and service to communities, as well as the company's public relations of all legal, legal public policy issues. That's my information. <laughs> I hope it's true. <laughs> and Jan Erik Sundgren joined the Volvo Group in 2006 as Executive Vice President for Public and Environmental Affairs. And since spring 2013, you're Senior Advisor to the CEO. Prior to joining the Volvo Group, you were the President of Chalmers University of Technology, right? Good. I will start by, by asking each of you the same rather open question. I'll give you some, some time to elaborate on that. And it has to do, of course, with how you work with, with um, making the transition for young persons into to, um, work easier. And, and um, I'll phrase the questions and you will pick up the things that you, you want to, to uh, answer. And what is your organization's <coughs> experience in recruiting young people? Do you have specific strategies to facilitate school-to-work transitions? And are these strategies uh, specifically targeting individuals or groups which have greater difficulties in, in entering the labor market? And I think we will start with Laurie, who has traveled the farthest to come here. <laughs> so you will have the opportunity to begin. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, yes, I lead Microsoft's uh, global corporate citizenship and. Uh, CSR work uh, around the world, and we have a special focus on youth, uh, helping create opportunities for education, employment, and entre entrepreneurship among young people around the world. It's an initiative that we call Youth Spark, so sparking opportunity for youth, and um, it is a philanthropy. It is also products and programs. Um, and a critical piece of all of that is partnerships. And what I'll talk about just for just a brief moment is how that addresses the question of from school to work transition. Certainly we have uh, programs about our, for our own employees, how we recruit and retain talent around the world. But uh, the focus of YouthSpark is really about investing in the future of the communities where we live and work. Uh, over 100 countries. We um, very much believe that um, without investment into the future and into youth, um, 
we together will not have much of a future to look forward to. So we think it's critical that we work together with government, with nonprofit organizations, with other companies uh, to find partnerships so that we can together uh, invest in young people and in that transition from work, uh, from, from school to work. Uh, it's interesting to me that the uh, opportunity to do so is different in uh, each region of the world, but uh, partnership is critical in every one of those cases. Um, three quick examples. In Latin America, we have a partnership with other large companies as well as the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, which is all about education and how education and the system there can help shape and prepare young people for employment. So we do a lot of investing in that um, em employment uh, partnership with others. In China, uh, the situation is very much about those employees that we see in our manufacturing plants and bringing technology training to them while they are working so that they can then prepare for opportunities uh, further on in their career. In Europe, we're very happy to have the opportunity to join the EU Grand Coalition on Jobs, which is all about helping build internships and apprenticeships. So you see it's different uh, challenges in every region, different opportunities, but in every case it takes partnership to address uh, the investment of youth and helping them transition from, from work, uh, from school to work. Thank you very much. Bjorn? Questions are the same. Yeah. Uh, well, Please. And the question was, what's your experience when it comes to recruiting young people? That was the first part of the question. And, and as a matter of fact, it would have been impossible for us to run our hotels without a lot of young, enthusiastic, and ambitious young people. I think we hire about 2,000 every year. And the majority of them are people that are between 18 and 28. And a lot of them come from the secondary school, some are graduates, and some are dropouts. And in, in many cases, this is the <coughs> first job ever. So this is the first time they meet the, uh, the, the work life. Uh, and we have the honor to, to, to meet them there and to sort of facilitate their first move into the working life. <coughs> but, of course, when, when they enter uh, one of our hotels, uh, they will meet a diversity. So it's not only about handling different kinds of skills. Uh, we have about 130 different nationalities uh, on our hotels. And that means when we have a gathering like this, there's no common language. Even if we are uh, at, at one hotel in, in Stockholm or in Oslo, uh, it's, we have some, some, trans, um, some, some small uh, translation uh, islands <laughs> all the way when we have these big meetings. So, so all these young people, they meet a, a diverse and um, a, a lot of people from different kinds of the, of, of the world. And one of the initiatives that we have uh, have launched, and we have done this in, in uh, cooperation with, uh, with the Swedish uh, Public Employment Service, and we have the same uh, cooperation with the, the Norwegian Labour and Welfare Administration. It's, it's uh, what we call the talent hunt. Um, and that's all about recruitment. Uh, and the reason why we have uh, done this, it's a big gathering. And the last time we did it was uh, when we opened a new hotel in Tromsø and we had about 1,000 auditions um, for 60 jobs. Uh, so, and, and some of the auditions, were the initial to, uh, the auditions were, were done by Skype. So that was uh, something new for us. But the reason why, and I will pick up that what Katarine uh, said earlier, uh, why do we do these auditions? Because a lot of these people have difficulties r showing their talent in the resume or a formal application. Uh, we have a program where the recently uh, arrived immigrants, and they have the language barrier as well. And then they can, they have this, uh, some minutes where they can uh, show themselves and show the talent. And it's a pleasure to see 
uh, a lot of these people, they are really shy. You say, well, how will this go when this, well, well they enter the stage? But uh, to see them blossom and to show their talent, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's magnificent to, to, to watch. And that's why we try to seek the, the hidden talents among all these young people, uh, because a lot of them have difficulties explaining them on the piece uh, or paper. So that's one example when we actually trying to yeah, well, implement the old phrase like hire for attitude and, and train for skills. So um, you should follow. We have a new gathering now, so if one of you want to see how this works in practice, you are so uh, welcome to, to uh, see uh, this uh, big gathering. It's a, it's a big venue. <coughs> Thank you, Robert. Does that mean that you've skipped scanning CVs? Or? No, no. We do some CVs as well, but they are not, they are not the, 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 the main thing yeah. of the, uh, so why they are, are, can come. They, can, uh, they say, well, I want to come, I have this interest, and then they are invited. And then we do these massive auditions. And well, for 60 jobs, 1,000 auditions, well, it takes a lot of resources, but we, we give them the opportunity to really show their talent. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Formal versus informal skills, or whatever you mm -hmm. call it. <laughs> Uh, we'll come back to that issue, I guess. Well, <coughs> John Eric, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure of being here. Uh, I represent um, a company, as you've heard, Volvo. Uh, not the Volvo car part. We sold them in, in 1999. So we're focusing on, on commercial vehicles, that is trucks and, and buses and construction equipment. So we are in an industry which is rather heavy. And we have, we're a global company with more than 100,000 employees and, and uh, roughly 50 in, in, in Europe. So we are heavily dependent upon of having engineers coming into our company, but also people that want really industrial jobs. And uh, we see the problem with the large unemployment. We have seen that for a number of, uh, uh, of obviously for a number of years. And we are of obviously worried that we cannot uh, secure that we get a good enough talents coming in in, in industrial situation. And mm. furthermore, the picture of a company like Volvo, we, I think, most realize that we provide jobs and we are an essential part of the econo economy, but most of people, at least in Sweden, think that we are going to move east with the production. <laughs> and particularly the young people think it's dirty, it's... Uh, noisy, it's low paid, it's the worst thing you want to do. So obviously we have a ch great challenge going forward. Also being in Sweden where the vocational education is not, and I'm not, uh, not exaggerating, it's not the best one in the world. Uh, it needs certainly to be improved. And we rely upon having a good vocational uh, education. So we have had, for many, many years, cooperation with municipalities. We own up and upper secondary schools together with, for example, the town of Gothenburg. But we thought that wasn't enough, particularly to get to the unemployed people. So two years ago, we started something we, which we called the Volvo Step. It's a one-year vocational training where we combine the theory with, with practice. We said, we'll try to do this on our own for three years, and then we'll see. We, we, so we, 2012, we went out and said, we have 400 places where we will provide you with a salary, we will provide you with an education, and we will provide you at least with the first line in your CV. <coughs> we didn't guarantee that job at the Volvo Group. Uh, we announced this mainly using social media, uh, since that's where, where, where young people are today, so, so no, no commercial, no normal ads in paper. So social media. We got to these 400, 400 uh, uh, job positions in, in 11 different city, municipalities in Sweden in, in, and in 13 different uh, locations. We got 4,000 uh, uh, applicants, out of which 50% were women or girls. In, in the industrial or engineering area, this is basically unheard of, and mm -hmm. I don't know why this is. But 
so we, we um, had 400 people entering in the end of 2012. Uh, they got a diploma, they got a certificate when they graduated a year from, from then. And we hired at that time roughly 25% of them. A fair fraction of them got other jobs, which was uh, the intention. Only 30 left the, the education. 10 because they got, uh, got into universities, which is fine. 10 because they got other type of job, which is fine and 10 out of personal reasons, a few that didn't want to work as early as 6 or 7 in the, in the morning. Uh, that, that, that is also fine. Uh, but but we, out, of, out of 400, only 30 left, uh, and 20 with, with good reasons. Uh, we have now entered into the second class. Again, we got uh, basically 4,000 4, applicants. Uh, again, the same number of, of girls. And um, we, and they, they are in the midst of, of, of this education. So we have worked together uh, with uh, uh, agencies like the one class represents in a very constructive way. We have worked together with learning institutions, with of course our own upper secondary school, but others also company called Lernia in Sweden to provide the theoretical part and we provide the, the, the practical part. We have asked uh, the people that have left uh, uh, these classes, what, what is your impression? impression? Well, the first thing they said, 96% of, of the first 300 and whatever, <coughs> uh, 70 that were asked, 96% uh, of them said that this, this was uh, absolutely great. They have changed uh, they, the way they, they see the future. Uh, they also all of them said, you need to communicate more. You need to be more visible in this society. You need to show what, what kind of a job there is and what kind of possibilities one has. Uh, and um, they also said the, the uh, working environment and, and the interaction with, with colleagues at the workplace was extremely important for them during this period. And the fact that they have some kind of safety net now where they have a line in the first CV and those lucky ones that got a job with us or others have eventually gotten a job. Uh, after this has been, after we started this, then the Swedish government has this uh, uh, employment work introduction programs, uh, well, whatever they're called, youth work introduction programs. I don't know what they're called. The Which, of course, now we, we'll, we'll First of all, help us to keep this program up, eh, because it reduces our cost a little bit, but that's not the most important part. But I think others will also follow, and I hope this will lead, in the end of the day, to a better vocational education in Sweden. And we are also prepared to do this in, in other countries. But, so we have a very good experience uh, by, by, by doing things ourselves, but with the help and with a strong partnership we, we, with agencies and with, with the school system. It wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Thank you very much. <laughs> the, the youth introduction program that you mentioned, I should just explain, is, is a recent program introduced by the government which, which allows employers to employ at 75% of the, the usual wage, introductory wage rate and, and uh, spend 25% percent of, of the time uh, on educational activities. So it so, uh, could have been uh, that they have been looking at you. Uh, perhaps. You never know. <laughs> uh, it's up and running. It's not, uh, it's, it's not a large volume yet, but I think it's a very promising initiative, uh, sort of yeah. in the right direction. Absolutely. Now, I'll proceed with a few other questions and, and uh, you will answer uh, as you like or whether you like <laughs> or not. <laughs> the, the first one is, is a rather broad one as well. Do, do you think, and possibly the answer is, is not the same in every country, I guess, but do you think that, that young people are in general prepared with the right type of, of skills and, and career guidance by, by the other stakeholders or actors in the system, such as schools and and vocational education and training institutions, and for that matter, public employment services. You, you touched upon it already, Jan Eric, when you mentioned the vocational education and training system in Sweden. But how about you, Lori, for instance? 
Is, the, is there a general universal answer to that, or <laughs> is it very different from country to country? Um, I think it's certainly different from country to country in terms of um, how youth are prepared. Uh, what I think is similar and what I think is common across all countries um, is the inner spark that, you, that resides in young people and how you tap into that and how you capture that and how you help build their imagination, inspire them and empower them is I think the key. Uh, and, and, the, and probably the best part of doing the work that we do, which is really understanding how we tap into that passion. You know, we talked, uh, you mentioned earlier the statistics about the challenges that are facing youth. Um, but what's wonderful to see is that when given the opportunity, the access, the resources, even at a minimal level, um, their optimism shines through. They are incredibly optimistic. In fact, there is research uh, that came out recently that talked about the optimism among youth despite the challenges. In fact, um, because of the challenges they're facing, the, this uh, attitude of we're going to make the changes that are necessary to really change the world. So I like to look at that as the common denominator to tap into um, and how to do that uh, how best to do that uh, goes back to, I think, understanding the local situation, the, whether that's the culture, the market environment, the partners, um, but then how, you know, what value does a company like Microsoft bring to that local mix? Uh, it's going to be different everywhere, but it's really about understanding what are others doing and then what can we do to add to that. Bjorn? Yeah, well, I started out with the uh, emphasize the attitude, mm -hmm. and um, well, um, it, it, when it, it's, it's difficult to give a, a general answer to, to, to your question, but it's easier, I would say, to find uh, programs that are initiated either by uh, educational uh, systems or other public uh, or governmental uh, institutions that are oriented uh, towards skills and education. Uh, but um, staying on this attitude path, it, it's difficult to find programs that really focuses on service-minded mm. uh, attitude. Uh, yeah, you, you know the, the more soft skills. Mm. Uh, and of course, uh, we would like to to, to cooperate with uh, with uh, other public institutions. And say, well, how can we build a program? that really look into that part of skill set as well. Yeah. Um, and, and I would say, well, we will be, we, will, we, we could be your uh, test lab if you come up with, with a really good program on that. I can promise you we'll implement it at once because there's no one, as far as I know, that has tried that and, uh, and take that part of the skill set, the soft skills. What's so interesting about yeah. that, of mm -hmm. course, is that those are skills that all employers need, mm -hmm. no matter the industry. Yeah. And so it is ironic, actually, mm -hmm. that, as you say, no one has really grasped no. onto that because we can all benefit from it, okay. whether that's a, a mm -hmm. hotel industry mm -hmm. or a technology industry, whether it's a big company or a small company, mm -hmm. we all would benefit from uh, young employees mm -hmm. who have the service attitude, mm -hmm. the enthusiasm, the, the discipline, mm -hmm in some cases, the entrepreneurial mindset. It's a bit depressing in some sense what you're saying, because at least in Sweden, I know there are certain, there are specific programs targeted towards the sort of tourism or hospitality sector, mm. both, I think, at the, mm. the secondary level and the mm. university level. So they don't provide you with, with people with the right attitude in some sense? Well, in general, they are focusing on sort of the hard skills yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and the educational part of it, the marks. So, but uh, the other path is, is, is as important as mm. well, so, yeah. Mm. Yeah, Catherine said that this is not a blaming game and, and yeah. it's everyone's business, and I couldn't agree more. <laughs> but, but, but let me give you one thing that I think should, could be improved, um, and I think it's not only for the Swedish system. Uh, the whole system is like a relay race. You leave the baton, from <coughs> primary school to secondary school and eventually up in secondary school leaves it to the industry and we are not coupled. So we need a stronger partnership to get away from this relay type of race. And uh, it's not only 
one's fault. Uh, industry and employers need to be more actively engaged. And, and I think we have the possibility. I could give you some more example of what the Volvo Group does. And I know that there are a number of companies that do this in, in Sweden and elsewhere in, in Europe and elsewhere in the world. But we need to do that with respect for each other's similarities, but also with respect for, for the differences. We are not coming into the school system and saying that we are better in pedagogy or, or didactics, mm -hmm. but we have other experience, and, uh, uh, and uh, then, then you could help even, mm -hmm. even getting the attitudes right. So I, I think mm -hmm. uh, the title of this mm -hmm. session is, is very good. Mm -hmm. We need more partnerships. It's mm. spot on. Spot now, on. Th yes. This is certainly an issue in the, in the Swedish context, uh, mm -hmm. as both you and I know, definitely, yeah. and, and I think a lot of people have identified that problem. We've taken some small steps in the right direction, I think. How, how about uh, Norway, for instance? Do, do you have a better partnership? No, well, I, I, I've, I think we have to need ask uh, the different industries, but what we don't see the big difference between the Swedish or the Norwegian partnerships. Uh, from our per, uh, perspective, so uh, no. But of course, we have a, a different situation in Sweden and, and Norway when it comes to youth unemployment. Uh, yes, very different. <laughs> very different, yeah. <laughs> so, um, it, w when but you that's for other reasons, then, I guess. Yeah, that's for <laughs> totally different reasons, yeah. <laughs> How about you, Laurie? Do you, do you see any good examples? Well, it, um, it's interesting, uh, I'll, I'm, I have a global role, but I'll speak for a moment about the U.S. And in the U.S., you know, our public education system and our um, business uh, world, are, they're, they're not usually operating in the same in, um, physical environment, right? Yeah, we look for people to come out of school with certain skills, uh, but we leave school schooling to the schools and we take care of the, the training related to the careers. Um, but what's, in, what's happened lately, uh, very recently, in the past year or two in the U.S., is that as a technology company, we are looking to fill more and more computer science, engineering, programming jobs. Uh, it's the fastest growing job sector, yet we don't get enough U.S. graduates with those degrees, with those qualifications. And uh, we decided to offer our services to public schools uh, to have our engineers come into the school and help teach a computer science course to the students. And when we first started this, and by the way, the idea was born by one of our engineers. It came from someone who saw a need and wanted to contribute what he knew as to be his skill. He saw a need to cultivate the pipeline of new uh, innovators. Well, when we first started doing this in the United States, I thought the schools would have a negative reaction. I thought they would say, uh, you know, leave the schooling to us, you know, you take care of something else. But in fact, um, the, the teachers, the principals were very open and the students were really interested and the demand has just skyrocketed. We can't even keep up with it. We now have not only our own engineers, but engineers from our other companies in the technology industry that we're training and providing curriculum to. And they, you know, they don't take over the whole classroom. They come in for one, one or two classes a week. And as they're teaching the basics of computer science, they're teaching the teachers so that the, the next year they leave and the teacher takes over that course. Now, it's not enough you know, to become employed at Microsoft immediately upon high school graduation, but it does light a spark in the young person's mind about a career path they might not have thought about before. Or they, and, and we find that if you don't think about that early enough, by the time you get to college, you, you know, you've lost that window of opportunity. You need to take some prep, prep courses before. So it's one of those situations where uh, initially, we thought the partnership wouldn't work because we, we should stay in our own roles, but we found that with a little bit of um, leaning into the opportunity and respecting the in classroom environment and tailoring it to what they needed, we've been able to see really great returns just in the past year or two. That's very interesting indeed. Yeah, yeah. It, I was going to move on to another sort of um, related subject, and, and that uh, has to do with sort of what happens once you 
get get onto a job. I mean, for for, for most people, there's some some view of career progression. I guess is an important issue. And I know Bjorn, from we spoke last night, also that you have a very high turnover rate of staff. So mm -hmm. so how how do you how, how do you work to sort of make young people stay? I don't know if it's a problem for Microsoft, or, but uh, no, well, it, it is an issue in some sectors, certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you take the sort of the total turnover, it's it's really high because a lot of the young people they have uh, well they have a year off in their study, so they work for us, um, or they just want to so sort of uh, work part time for a couple of years before they start some some other career. But um, we try to target uh, those who uh, really want uh, a career in the hospitality industry, uh, and we have some top down programs. To, to sort of follow up uh, and sort of take them in and really sort of guide them through the system. But, but we have realized that our most important tool when it comes to career development and, uh, and really making the, the young people uh, wanting to stay in the hospitality industry and see the opportunities is the local manager. <laughs> so what we can do to support the local manager because he or she is the one that's, well, meet them every day, supervise them, guide them, see their talent. And, and so, so what we can do to the local managers, it's, uh, it's a realization we have had the last couple of years, it's much more important than top-down programs. Because the top-down programs has a tendency to sort of go outside the, the whole system. Uh, so, so I would say our most important tool is the local manager, and they are doing the recruitment as well. Interesting. So mm -hmm. what you need more than career prospects is a good boss. Yeah, well, if I had to choose, I would do leadership development <laughs> to prosper career development for young people. And that goes back to the soft skills again, yeah, doesn't it? it is. Yeah. How about to Volvo, Janne, do you have problems no. keeping people once you've attracted them well, to Well, pa partly, partly not. Uh, in some, some areas, it's no problem keeping them. But I think what, what you said about the local <coughs> manager is extremely important, that you should, you should secure that you have a good manager mm -hmm. that, that, that keeps track of his or her employees. We have something called the personal business plan. Everyone has to have a personal business plan, and the follow-up is the local manager. We see that also in terms of this apprenticeship program we have, this I mentioned before, Volvo Steget. The supervision is crucially important uh, for, for how the, the young people perceive uh, their time with us. But it's not only important for, for the young people that come in. It's also important for the supervisor, mm -hmm. because they also develop. And one of the striking things that many have said of, of these people we took in, of these 400, that we didn't offer a guarantee for a job, was that, well, I see that you can become a group manager even at the age of 28, 25, 26. And I think the, the, that is, is extremely important, that you have this visibility. So I, I agree completely what, with what you said. Mm -hmm. I did presume that you didn't have any possible problems <laughs> keeping people in Microsoft, but I'm, I'm not sure if it's true, so maybe you want to say <laughs> something about that. Well, it's a competitive industry. And uh, actually, there are a lot, of, a lot of other companies competing for the same talent. So we do have to look very closely at um, creating the, you know, a good work environment. Um, and good training opportunity and good development opportunity. So there's quite a lot that we invest in that. Um, uh, because, uh, yeah, even though they may be quite happy uh, at, at our company, we also know there's lots of, there are, there are more jobs in, in technology right now than people to fill them. So it's a competitive market for talent. I'm going to move to another question, which, which I think some of you already touched upon, but it, it has to do with sort of what type of skills are you looking for? Uh, has that changed over time? Uh, we talk a lot about uh, various types of, of skill demand changes, and are you satisfied with, with uh, what is provided by, by the sort of uh, education and vocational training system? I already touched upon it, but particularly the issue of, of changing sort of skills demand? Or mm. yeah, well, is it the soft skills that is, is going well, to be the I future think always for the young there. people? So, uh, and, uh, uh, the, the soft skills has always been in the, in the hospitality. But what have changed the last uh, well 20 years, and especially the last 10 years, is uh, 
the uh, the technology revolution even in the hospitality industry and i think a lot of people think well being a receptionist as a, lo a lot of young uh, boy, boys and girls start uh, off with is an easy job it's just checking in checking out but if you look behind the counter there's uh, a lot of technology not for just the systems but uh, but for the whole whole uh, building um, and being uh, uh, these uh, night duties, it's uh, it's become a technological uh, job, and I don't think that we have been good enough to train them in that, and we've created some frustration, I would say. So even in the hospitality industry, we see <laughs> the introduction of the, the technology race, uh, and that's an important <coughs> part to have a general knowledge of uh, not just software, but all the things that regulates a building and so on, which is pretty complicated after all. Just organizing a conference like this. Yes, yeah. it's complicated. So ask the guys in the, in the corner over there, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Anerik? My perception is that there's been a gradual very strong change of, of the requirements on people employed in the manufacturing industry, particularly. Well, well, well uh, of course, we have the same thing, that, that technology uh, is coming into everything, mm. and the IT systems, and you cannot do anything without uh, 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 mastering those. And, but I would say that uh, young people today ha have, have, obviously, we can complain about their skills in mathematics and physics, or what have you, mm. particularly for engineers. But they have other skills that, that are far superior than 10 years ago. For example, in, in IT, in, in some of the social skills are, 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 are also uh, very, very good today. But of course, we, we continuously, uh, we, have a, we have our own, what we call the Volvo University, where, where we have our own tr training education for our employees. And we have, on an annual basis, 500,000 days per year for our 100,000 employees, which we put them through this, mm. this uh, own training program. So ob obviously we need to train them. And it would be very strange if, if, if they came in from school and know everything about how to assemble a truck. <laughs> I, I, I don't think we should have schools like that. Why we, we, do that we do that our best ourselves. <laughs> Thank you. Anything you want to add, Laurie? Uh, yeah, I think what I would add to that this conversation is, um, I, I mean, I spoke about the need for more of a pipeline of computer science engineers for Microsoft and for other companies who are hiring these innovators to develop our products and services. Um, but it's not just the technology companies that need young people with these skills. And when we started our work in um, our community work around the world, we focused a lot on supporting the development of IT skills, basic digital literacy, using productivity software. The reason we did that was because our customers, whether it was a hotel or a car company or a truck company, our customers needed employees with those basic IT skills, and we wanted to contribute to that by helping train them. Now, we are still doing that, but we have expanded the training that we're supporting to helping provide greater access to programming skills, coding skills, computer science basic skills. And why is that? Yes, it's for our own pipeline of employees, but it's also for the fact that those kinds of skills are required in more and more jobs outside the mm. IT industry. Mm. So whether it is the retail, tourism, healthcare, mm. um, and manufacturing, all of those industries are increasingly having job opportunities for people with those skills and requiring those skills throughout their businesses. So what we've done is we've shifted more of our investments in communities and into training into some of that, into that area of providing greater access to those skills, uh, computer programming and coding and computer science education so that we can reach a larger segment of the youth population and help prepare them for jobs, not just in the tech industry, but in all industries. Interesting. Uh, I was going to ask a question with, with regard to um, what it is, uh, what is the most challenging for your organization when, when partnering with, with public institutions? So you, have, you have some experiences, John Eric, in, 
in Göteborg at least. Well, now we have experience uh, globally, I would say. I mean, we, we have worked for a number of years with many public institutions, uh, universities we have worked for ages with. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, one of the, mo the most important part is, is to enter into a partnership with mutual respect an understanding of each other. So we often start, when, when we started, uh, when we have started now a, a similar program, letting our engineers into to sec upper secondary schools, mm -hmm. exactly as Microsoft have done. We steal with pride. Uh, uh, <laughs> and and um, then we started by having, get, having our engineers understanding the Swedish school system today, because that's, most of them went into a school system that looked a little bit different. Even if you are a young engineer at <laughs> Volvo, the school system was different five years ago. So, so understanding, and we teach also the teachers in the schools mm -hmm. about Volvo, mm. uh, so that they know something. So we can start with a mutual respect and understanding that we have a common common vision and I think that is in in any type of project you run in, independently if it's with public institutions or if we with, with uh, suppliers you need to do the same thing so I don't think it's much different it's very much in line with the theme for this <laughs> session <laughs> is there anything you'd like to add on that issue yeah, well, we have had uh, good cooperation with uh, well, both in Norway and Denmark and Sweden. Uh, but I think that both we and, uh, well, especially working with the public institution, we need to be a bit more courageous. We need to trial and error. We need to uh, try something crazy. I, as, and as I said, we can be your test lab. So you have the implement implementation base. So I think we need to do something uh, new. Uh, and try, really try to uh, find how can we tailor-made a program, even for an industry or for a company, that really sort of finds the right talent for that kind of company or for that kind of industry. I think that's one of both our challenge and your, your challenge uh, going further on. Mm -hmm. Lori? Um, well, I agree with, with what both gentlemen said. What I would just add is that um, I f we find that in working with uh, public organizations, public institutions, another critical uh, player is the nonprofit sector. And so, you know, from a, a public company standpoint, uh, so private sector, you have public sector, and then the nonprofit sector. The nonprofit sector uh, can really be a wonderful liaison uh, between the private sector and the public sector uh, in terms of identifying where we can all add the greatest value. And of course, the nonprofit sector is different country by country, region by region. But, um, but usually that is one of the first places that we will look for the partnership and for perhaps the glue to build that sort of local community impact. Thank you. A final question, and, and uh, it has already been mentioned that this is not a blame game, so I, I will ask you to say what is the top of your list in terms of what could public and possibly non-profit, other non-profit actors do better, and, and, but I will also ask you what, what could employers mm. do better in mm. order to, to ease the transition for young people from the school system to work. Well, well I said, well, we, we need to be more in innovative when we sort of organize or uh, conduct these programs. But I think employers uh, need to be more, uh, well, non-traditional themselves. Uh, I mean, I, we feel that we, we, we look for people that only want to have uh, uh, eight to four jobs. Uh, they have the proper uh, resume and so on, even if we have this initiative. So I think we need to go out of that comfort zone that we have been in for a long time. And I, th I hope that we can you know, work together with a lot of institutions uh, uh, and try to see, well, there's, a, there's um, a lot of talents, a lot of opportunities out there, and uh, we can find them and we can organize their working uh, situation in another way, in a different way, uh, so they can uh, actually have, have, have a work, even if it's 80%, 60%, or if it's in, in, yeah, well, in, in different kinds. So I think we need to be a bit more innovative ourselves. <laughs> Thank you. What's on top of your wish list? 
Uh, I mean, I, I would agree with that, actually, the, uh, which the speaker mentioned earlier about um, talent and not having such a defined view of exactly what the talent should look like, but having a, a, a more flexible view and an approach that can identify talent. I mean, like you said with your uh, the pitch demonstration as not just looking at the CV, but looking, how can, I think pro, um, companies can do a better job of looking at the world of talent with um, a more open mind and identifying different types of talent um, in, as you say, maybe a non-traditional sense. So I think that's probably um, on, on us to do a better job of. Uh, I, I, can only, I, I will only talk what employers can do, 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 do better because I think that's there are nice of you. Ma 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 many things employers can do better. I, I happen to be chairman of something called Techniksprånget, at which is an internship program for people that have uh, left uh, up at up in the secondary school to sort of stimulate them to get, get more interested and more motivated for, for science and engineering issues, to get more into engineering fields. And we have 140-something companies that are participating. But it's very difficult to get companies to participate if you don't have a commitment from the top. Otherwise, you will never get a buy-in. And a buy-in is extremely important. Otherwise, there are tons of excuses why you shouldn't go out uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to the class that mm -hmm. you have committed to, to, to support in terms of teaching. There are many, many, many excuses when you come down in, in, in the veins of, 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 of a company. So buying from the top and a commitment from the top such that it penetrates the organization, then I think employers can do a lot, <coughs> lot of things. And, and we are struggling with this in this program techniques sprung at, uh, to get more and more. And I have heard all, all, all kinds of excuses. No one really good. <laughs> uh, but, but I've heard all kinds of excuses, except for those companies where you have a strong commitment from, from, from the leaders and a strong commitment from, from the people working in there. Then you get excited people from companies. You can, can do a lot. So no more bad excuses. <laughs> no, no, no more bad excuses. <laughs> I heard Bill Fisher from uh, IMD uh, some years ago, and he said something that made me think, because he said, well, all companies, they're doing the same uh, mistake. They go out there and they try to hire extraordinary people. And they put them together and they create ordinary results. <laughs> uh, and said, well, what you should do, he said to us, well, you should go out there, hire some ordinary people, put them together, provide them with leadership, organization, technology, and then create extraordinary uh, results. So <laughs> I think that was, uh, made me think. <laughs> well, it touches upon a problem that I've noted a lot in, in the Swedish labor market, at least, the fact that all employers are looking for, for people with 10 years experience mm. and, no one, but, and no one is looking for the same person as who newly graduated. Mm. So there's a, a, sometimes a scarcity of people with 10 years experience, but there is a surplus of people mm. with, who have just graduated. And, and that's mm. sort of the only ones who can deal with that problem are the employers. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to open up for questions from the floor. I think there will be at least <coughs> some people moving around with microphones. Those, you don't see the sun, but for those of us who are on the stage, we see the sun all of the time, so, and it's facing us, so I'm not, you have to wave a bit so that we see you. Here's a question. And I should say, I'm, I'm, although I primarily you should address your questions to the people who are still on stage, I won't refuse if there's a question to one of the f former speakers as well. Thomas Townsend from Canada. Um, first of all, congratulations on the efforts that uh, each of your companies is making in this area. Um, in Canada, about 80% of new jobs, however, are created by small and medium enterprises. Do you have any ideas on how you can get um, employers that are in the small and medium enterprise area in the same kinds of initiatives that you're doing? Um, Please feel free, any one of you. John Eric. Yeah. Well, 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 I think you address a very important, a very important issue and, and a very difficult issue as well. If you live with liquidity crisis up to your neck uh, every day, of course, it's very difficult to, to allocate resources. But 
small and medium-sized companies live in most cases in a symbiosis with large companies. So get them partnership again with small and medium-sized companies can, can I think mitigate this, this problem. But it's not, not easy and I have no, no, no single solution because I don't think there is a single solution. Yeah. But I mean, we, 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 we rely upon having co good contacts with small and medium sized companies, but, but it's a difficult issue. Well, one, one thing that we have done um, in a number of places in the UK in particular most recently is where we'll invest in the training programs um, and then we'll invest in a match-up service with the uh, small and medium size uh, technology companies. So companies that are our partners or in our general ecosystem who are smaller, uh, local, and have the need, but don't have the ability or the um, resources to do, invest in the training. So we'll invest in the training and then provide that matching service for their employment needs. Mm -hmm. We found that to be an interesting, um, an interesting situation where we're each bringing something to the party. Uh, if you go to the Norwegian uh, situation, I think we have more or less the same situation as you have in, in Canada. 85% of all our companies are 19 employees or less. So, so most of the companies are small companies. Uh, and what I've sort of thought about uh, sometimes, and why don't they go into together and have this great recruiting, uh, recruitment venues or uh, management uh, development program when they can combine sort of 10 companies together. I'm not sure if there are any examples of that, but that would be maybe an, an idea uh, in a geographical area to sort of match up uh, and, and do this uh, cross-company uh, development programs. Sounds like a natural idea, teaming mm. up in some yeah. sense when you're small and mm. too, it's too expensive to do it on your own. Please, there's a question here, right in front of the stage. <laughs> Hello, yeah, my name is Lennart Werner. I'm from the southeast of Sweden, Kalmar, and I have a question for you about uh, uh, general uh, assessments or, or uh, specific we, in Sweden, we have now a, a discussion whether we should have a lower tax for young people mm -hmm. entering the labor market. And, and what, what's your uh, uh, position on this? I, whether we should have general uh, assessments or specific projects helping young people into the labor market? From Bjorn and I discussed yeah. this issue last night, so I know <laughs> yeah. at least that you have an opinion I'll on it. I definitely have an opinion on this, yeah. Well, of course, for us, it's... Um, it's um, uh, it will be uh, pretty dramatic if we raise uh, the, the the tax on, on young people. I think we've done some calculations, and for us, it's about 300. It finances about 300 extra uh, positions, and hospitality is a low margin uh, industry, so two three percent. So for us, that would be pretty dramatic, actually. So. I should give you the background possibly for those of you who are from abroad. In Sweden, there's a reduced payroll tax for people under 26. So yeah. It's half the payroll tax, which normally is 30%, so it's 15 approximately, I think. Mm. Someone will probably correct me afterwards, but mm. approximately. Mm. Which means it, and that's, that's a, a general reduction, and there's been a, a long discussion whether there should be a general reduction or whether it's better to have targeted reductions, and that's what you mentioned, to, to specific groups of young mm. people who are farther or further away from the labor market. Mm. And it makes it much easier for us to hire young people, mm -hmm. of course. Mm. Any one of you want to comment on that? I was born in, in the Swedish context, I guess, the question. <laughs> <laughs> now, anyone else? Please, over there. Seems the microphone doesn't work yet. Hello, yes. Um, Patricia Steiner, German Embassy, Labour and Social Affairs, Atashi. And um, as you already mentioned, we have a formalized system where employers are very engaged, traditionally very engaged, and they also put a lot of money and effort in the dual and training system, vocational training system. Yet our needs number is not that much lower than in Sweden, meaning that we still have quite a large group of young people who have problems getting into the vocational training, which is to a huge part provided by employers. 
And um, the question for us very often is how can we change that threshold? And we see actually now that companies um, hire young people from Spain or from Sweden or from elsewhere in Europe because they have better soft skills, sometimes better academic skills than our needs group. And how can we actually get companies to focus more and give needs people a, a chance here? How do you reach those at the margin? Yeah. I guess the question is, to some extent. I, I, I don't know, but we are looking at Germany and, 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 and taking Germany <laughs> as an... So you, I get really disappointed right now. <laughs> uh, uh, we have built our whole system on, 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 as I said before, stealing with pride, and we have stole the whole Volvo step with pride from Germany. Youth so. unemployment is good. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the problem, it's the needs group that's still there. No. Yeah, okay, the needs, all right. I think the German uh, model or, or mm. system uh, so addresses one of the problems with youth unemployment, namely that it, the transition from school to, to work is cumbersome for young persons, but it doesn't, of course, address the problem that young people don't even go to school. Mm -hmm. no. uh, and that's another issue. No, sir. Jörn, That's worry. a tough one. <laughs> we didn't expect that question from Jörn, so <laughs> we don't have any answers. I th I actually, There's I mean, a question I over there. Oh. In the corner, I think. Well, while that's being addressed, I mean, just to just to respond a little bit more on the neat question. Uh, look, I th I think it really comes down to greater communication between the uh, the, the the private the, the companies and government um, about what are the gaps that still need to be filled in either addressing the neat community or. Um, or even those who perhaps are more mainstream but maybe have, are at risk of falling into the neat uh, community. I think that that's where a greater dialogue so that we can understand if we are going to make an investment in a given community, is it better that we make an investment here versus there? Um, because maybe your challenge or your problem is more of this rather than that. So I guess gr even greater communication and dialogue at perhaps that goes even deeper into the company, like um, this gentleman re uh, remarked, that it needs to be, you know, from the commitment from the top and commitment deep in the company to understand what the real challenges are, and then therefore how to make our best investments into the communities because they are going to be different. So. My name is Lars Jokke Stoll. I work at the, in the city of Malmo, South Sweden. Uh, I would like to hear the panel's view on. Uh, on a creating perhaps a better gender balance when it comes to youth and school education and vocational training in these three different industries that you represent. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a need for an explicit or implicit uh, policy uh, from an employer perspective? Is there an issue of, well, I guess in, in manufacturing there's an issue of attracting uh, young ladies. Of, of course, there is a gender issue. I mean, we are working constantly to, to, to fill this. And, and as I said in the beginning, to our big surprise, when we went out for this apprenticeship program, we got equal amount of, of, of girls and, and boys, which is a very encouraging sign. I wish I knew why. We don't know that, know that yet. I spent eight years of my life uh, as the president of an engineering university. And the topmost priority there is to get more women into to IT areas, into mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. And I think there are, even, uh, there are also other areas in, in the school system. If you take teacher education, for example, you have the opposite uh, problem. You get, need to get more men in, into the teacher. So it's a great, a huge problem. And... Uh, uh, we are doing our best, but, but, it, but, but someone said to me, if we are going to get equal in terms of mechanical engineers in Sweden between, I, 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 between uh, wo woman, women and, and men, we are talking about geological time frames. <laughs> and, and, and we cannot afford geological time frames in, in, in this area. I, so. I, do, I do think it's interesting. I mean, certainly there's more that employers can do and there's more that universities mm. can do and school systems. But the gentleman from Glasgow talked about the importance of addressing cultural issues early in a child's life. 
You know, so the messages that we in society generally communicate to children from the ages of two, three, four, five, six, and seven, that's what starts, that's really where it begins. And so I think this is a, a question for, a, it's a collective uh, responsibility, really, to think about the messages that we send to our children when they're young, collectively. I absolutely personally think you're right. We should start addressing those issues early in life and not, uh, <laughs> not when they're about to enter university education or whatever because then somehow it's too late. Often. And I mean, we probably have the, uh, the opposite problem from you. We, we have more females than male, uh, of course, and we worked with, because um, if you go some years back, we had 60-65% uh, uh, women, uh, but we had only 20-30% 20, 20, yeah, 20, percent uh, female or women managers. So we sort of work that up now, so we, we have the same balance on, on both the managers uh, new, uh, level, and, and uh, so it reflects the, uh, the, the, the community of, of all the employees. So our biggest challenge when, it's come, when it comes to balance out is the ethnic uh, balance. Uh, which we we ha we have the same sort of challenge now that we have with the, the gender balance uh, ten years or twenty years ago. Good. There was someone else waving. I don't know who was first in line, but I can see you. So. <laughs> <laughs> there is a microphone coming. <coughs> John Sweeney from Ireland. We've. Uh, I was a national expert on the Irish report, and my organization has since gone on to look at pedagogies in further education and training. And uh, we quoted at our employers a remark made by McKinsey that soft skills is hard work, but that very few are doing the hard work. Mm. And it chimed exactly with uh, what we've heard from Norway. There is some elixir there. And there's no doubt that prolonged unemployment does most damage on the soft level. Mm. And that without what we call soft skills, hard skills are harder to acquire. Mm. But I, I suggest that it really is a huge challenge to pedagogy in further education and training, in vocational education and training. Because, uh, again, from Irish employers, the experience would be that soft skills can't really be imparted on a standalone basis. They are better as a dimension too training that is also imparting sector-specific hard skills. I wonder mm. if anyone would like to comment. I understand this was a comment, but maybe you want to comment on the comment. So. <laughs> no, no, I, I just want to echo the, the importance of soft skills. It's, no, it's not only for, for your business. Yeah. Even when you assemble a truck, you need really soft skills. If you're going to get good working team, if you're going to do this with, with quality, which our customers require, so, uh, so I think it's um, uh, an important part. We try to do that in, in this so vocational own program, but in, uh, in the theoretical part, really having soft skills in terms of how you work together in a group uh, mm. uh, uh, and more of the social uh, skills. It's, it's, so it's not only mm. in yeah. your business. Now we will have time for at least one more question. And I see one person waving over there. Yes, it's you. Now we only need a microphone. Where did the mics go? Is one behind? I think they are changing the battery or something, but <laughs> if you raise your hand again, they will see you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Josephine Passan, I'm from Sweden. Um, we're talking about school to work transitions and a major issue for people in this age, myself being one and seeing amongst my peers, even the more well-educated ones, uh, an increase in job insecurity with people on temporary contracts, unpaid internships, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. While this can be a good first step towards getting to know the labor market, it is also a major obstacle for people who are in the um, process of starting their lives. Having temporary contracts mm -hmm. makes it difficult to buy an apartment, mm -hmm. to start your uh, family, to plan for children, etc. And uh, the previous speakers touched a bit upon this, but I was just wondering what the, uh, you see as the responsibility of employers in addressing uh, job insecurity for young people. Any one of you who wants to pick up this yeah, issue? Well, I, I can just totally agree. 
uh, that's a, a, a big problem uh, for uh, a lot of uh, young people when they are only offered uh, temporary jobs. Uh, we are trying to um, to uh, do what we can, but some some of our hotels we close them down for four months because yeah, well, there's no guest uh, resource and so on. And so, so how do you employ people at uh, in in those geographical areas for a full-time job? It's it's difficult. But uh, well, I think we we work closely with the unions to, to find out uh, to how can we give maximum uh, sort of security, but at the same time have the flexibility for young people. And well, I don't have the answer, but uh, it's, it's a difficult task, but we are really, really, really trying because we want them to have a secure uh, work environment because then they will stay in our company for uh, many years. So. But if somebody has the recipe, I would, <laughs> I will be here after the session. <laughs> it is a structural phenomenon in it the is, labor market. Yeah. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it is time to uh, wind up. I want to thank all of the speakers, panelists, and all of you in the audience who have listened and contributed with questions. Thank you very much. The next uh, item on the agenda is coffee break, I guess. Yeah, but I need to say something first. <laughs> please. please, go ahead. But please give, go ahead and give them a big head for you. <laughs> I'm sorry, you will soon get your coffee. But I just want to inform you that after the coffee break, it's time for the workshops. And as I said this morning, the first letter on your name badge says uh, which uh, workshop you have chosen. You find a map on page 36 in your little booklet. And now, the most important, for the ones of you who have chosen workshop D, as in Denmark, or F like in France, you are going to another building where for the Public Employment Service offices, actually. So I suggest that you go and take your coats before you go to the workshop. Before, because directly after the workshops, we are going to the boats. And uh, in order to be in time for the boats, it's best if you have everything and you go directly from that office to the boats. And there will be hostesses showing the way to the boats after the workshop. Okay? So see you on the boats and have a nice workshop. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure.